Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Robert Baharian and this is Masters in Investing. They say life never stops teaching and we never stop learning. This show is my exploration with investors to both understand and unpack what is going on in markets right now and what this means for business and for investors. Please don't forget to subscribe and leave us an awesome review. Let's get into it. My guest today was Richard Quinn, CIO and Principal of Bentham Asset Management. Today we talk about the impact of rising interest rates, we talk about inflation, we talk about the involvement of central banks and the amount of money that's being pumped into the economy and the system. We talk about alternative assets, digital currencies, we talk about money laundering, and what all of this actually means for investors in a time that is super interesting at the moment and almost a 180 degree turn from where we were 12 months ago. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Richard Quinn, good morning and welcome to Masters in Investing. Yeah, hi Rob, uh, thanks for having us here. It's good. Pleasure. Now, I want to get straight into it. Uh, the words on everybody's lips at the moment is inflation, higher interest rates, and that will be the demise of long-term bond holders, the demise of equity holders. Can you just give us a rundown of like, what is going on at the moment? Why, why do we have these headlines and why is the horror uh, being spilled out in the papers at the moment? Uh, and why then are investors responding the way they are? Yeah, listen, we have a, a very interesting environment. Obviously, we've kept uh, interest rates have been put to a very, very low level, uh, close to zero. Um, so if you're borrowing for a house or something like that, I've, I've heard of uh, rates sub of 2%, which is you know, a pretty thin credit margin from my point of view. Uh, and we've come from an environment where we've had half the economy shut because of the pandemic. Um, so governments have also put in a lot of stimulus, uh, huge amounts of stimulus, north of 6% of GDP. Uh, and we're, you know, we have a vaccine coming through and the economy is about to reopen with a lot of uh, saving uh, that's been done. In actual fact, we've had income growth during this last recession, which is quite bizarre. Yeah. So, yeah, it's an unusual environment um, and people are concerned about it. I mean, Why are they concerned about it? I think they're concerned because valuations for most assets run off the long bond and the long bond in the US at the beginning of the year was sitting below 1%. Um, but can we go back before COVID? Yeah, sure. And, and it appears as though when you look at the long-term bond yields, it, it just looks like we've had this this U-shaped dip, and we've simply gone back to where we were pre-COVID. Right? And then there's this hysteria about yields dropping significantly, and that was a reflection of what was going on in, in the world last year, yep. and, it, it, and it appears as though we've probably turned the corner yep. from there, uh, and yields have simply gone back to, to where they were. I'm, I'm, just, I, I'm just missing what... Yeah, the, the yields haven't gone back to where they were. I mean, the 10-year bond is still low, which we're talking about, and I talk mainly about the US 10-year bond sure. because I think it's the, um, the reserve currency of the world and that's what drives a lot of things. So uh, that's sitting around 1.6% uh, uh, now. Um, you know, before this, I think you, you know, it would have been north of two. Um, so, but we've had this long period of... Uh, a structural change in inflation. You've had, you've had disinflation, and um, you know you haven't had that much deflation. Like we had a small period of that post two thousand eight, um, and the short end is still very low. Like it's yeah, know, the short end is you know is probably twenty five basis point. We sure one of a percent on the cash rate. I mean, the the real issue is that makes cash almost an uninvestable asset. Because you're, um, you know, inflation's still running. Oh, listen, what's it running? One, one point six percent or something. But hasn't that always been the issue, where cash has largely been for the last few years almost an uninvestable asset? Yeah, I think so. Uh, 
but it's also it preserves an option to invest in something else, right? Um, and I suppose that's why we have cash as an asset. Um, but again, uh, the main reason we've got cash very low is because central banks have uh, worked on monetary policy to keep mm. rates low, um, which has, is, is supposed to encourage people to move cash into active yes. investments. Yeah. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of that. You mm. know, like we're, we're going into an environment where we're seeing a uh, GDP number globally that's mm. probably north of 6%. Now everyone says it's off a low base. Well, yeah, it's not that low a base. Um, and then we have uh, an inflation pulse that will probably be north of 3%. Um, and we've got a, a 10-year bond rate sitting at you know, currently 1.6, but it was 1% at the beginning of the year. And so what does that then mean? If you've got interest rates going up, you've got strong GDP numbers, you've got inflation numbers, uh, what, what, is, what does all of that mean for the world and for people who are investing their money? Yeah, well, the, I suppose the real thing when we're investing money is we're trying to protect the real value of that. Sure. So you keep the purchasing power of the money. Um, if you're investing in an asset that's giving you a return less than inflation, uh, you're obviously going backwards. Sure. And so, you know, the starting point for most investors is to cover the inflation risk to keep the real uh, uh, purchasing power of money. Um, and hopefully, and most people have a target of uh, inflation plus, you know, most people have an inflation, uh, a return target of inflation plus three yeah. as a total return. Um, and it's going to be harder to achieve uh, with the base rates where they are. But the base rates... Uh, are used to price lots of assets, not just bonds. They're used to price equities. They use, you know, if you look at long infrastructure assets and just, uh, you know, pricing the discounted cash flows for a lot of equities, they use the, the low discount rate. And is that why we're seeing a lot of these growth stocks get, well, get hammered over the last couple of weeks yeah. just because of, you know, PE? Valuations on some of those stocks. Yeah, listen. You know, the reality is, if you've got a uh, an asset that's got a an effectively a ten year duration, I'd say equities may even have a longer duration mm. than that. A one percent raise in that uh, gives you a ten percent loss. Um, so, you know, as you get increases in interest rates, it should knock on. It depends what the growth rate, the underlying growth rate is post this. Uh, I do think growth is going to be strong. I think activity is going to be strong post this. And, and so if that, that is the case, um, why are interest rate rises bad? Yeah, that's a good point. Well, that, that, by definition, I think having a positive yield curve, which means the low rate is low and the, uh, the longer rate is higher, uh, is positive. It shows that an economy is likely to be growing. So I don't over, think it over is time, a, right? Yeah, I don't think that is a bad thing. Um, when you've... I, I, I think the concern is right now because unemployment rates are high, um, central banks want to be seen to have accommodative monetary policy. and That's why they've got the short interest rate low. Now, longer term, um, I think this will be quite a quick recovery, partly because the whole economy is... An happy. economic recovery? Yeah. I, I think, you know, half the economy is functioning really well and doing quite well. Uh, you know, a lot of the... Uh, online-based things have done exceptionally well. Um, and then you've got another part of the service economy that's been shut. And I think that that's almost a, um, a binary economy where the light's going to be turned back on and it's going to come back quite strong. I think a lot of people are looking forward to, you know, going out to dinner, they're looking mm. forward to going out, enjoying entertainment uh, alike. Um, so I think activity is going to come back pretty strong. And we've got okay activity even in this current environment. <laughs> Um, and we've had a lot of government support, but the government support is surreal um, and it's not finished yet. Like we just recently we've had uh, the, uh, the US government decide to spend another $1.9 mm. trillion uh, that's going to be injected to uh, the lower part of the um, demographic in the US, which will probably spend it very quickly. Uh, and that's the point though, right? Yeah, that's right. I, listen, I, I think... Uh, Biden doesn't want to make the same mistake that Obama made. Obama didn't spend enough, probably because he couldn't. Um, and now Biden's spending more. And then we, you know, they're 
you know, the housing stock in the US doesn't have much inventory right now, mm. so there's a lot of building to happen. And then they're possibly going to spend another $2 trillion on infrastructure. And that's a problem here too, though, right? In Australia, when you talk about housing and you have shortages and things like that, the, the whole inflation and government uh, intervention and, and money printing and quantitative easing, it's been going on for some time, right? And for the last 10 plus years, we've been almost yearning for inflation. This is not going to work. We need inflation. We need inflation. We need rate. We need ultimately rates to rise because yeah. that's, that's, the, that's the outcome. And then we get it and everyone shits themselves. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's just the way markets behave. Why? Uh, I just think, you know, basically we all try to project uh, the current environment continuing on the way it is. I, like I don't think generally people are good at changes. Uh, you know, we've had low inflation for a long period of time. And we, you know, we've actually gone from not wanting to spend fiscally to now spending amazingly fiscally. Like the fiscal uh, spendthrift nature that we've got coming through now is, is a big change. Mm. The reason we have, uh, or the reason we had uh, inflation targeting was because you couldn't trust governments not to spend too much. Sure. Um, now, uh, now we've got central banks saying they want them to spend more, and they are. You know, and then we'll see what happens in this recovery. I think there's a lot of pent up demand. Uh, there's a lot of. Uh, uh, Cost push and demand pull going on right now. I think what it's does that mean? Interesting time. Well, basically, it means it, you you will see inflation this year. You'll see inflation this year. Now, whether it's transitory, um, a lot of the central banks. And again, I'm more a credit guy than a, a, an interest guy. Um, but central banks are st- talking about they're going to allow for average inflation to go up. They used to have a set inflation target. If it went above that inflation target, they get aggressive. Right now, what they're saying is, they see inflation come through, they're going to let it. You know, go above that level for a while to average at a, you know, for the US a 2%, Australia range between 25 to 2 And is that central banks' way of trying to manage uh, investor and public's um, expectations? Yeah, I think we ask too much of central banks. Like, I think <laughs> their, their toolkit's uh, been expanded a bit too much. I, I, to be honest, I think... Uh, but... You know, we're coming out of a pandemic. This is an unusual environment. It's a, it's a very unusual environment. Like the last time we came out of a pandemic, we had the roaring 20s after a First World War, right? Yeah. Like, you know, there was a lot of debt in the market then. I, I think everyone's worried about there being a lot of debt in the market now. What's, what's wrong with a lot of debt? What's wrong with a lot of government debt? Uh, listen, there's, uh, some people argue there's a crowding out. I don't think there's a crowding out. But just, you know, basically it could limit growth down the track. That's that's probably a reason people are worried about it. At certain times, you know, sometimes you need a substitute. Um, we've we've had a lot of middle class welfare. Um, this time round, it's different. And uh, sorry, when I say this, this recession has been different because this recession was caused by uh, a health crisis, and the government shut the economy down. Sure. Now, now there's. But does it matter what causes it and what shuts the economy down, whether yeah, it's... Well, it does to a certain extent. Like the moral, uh, if if everything rolls over just because of speculative bubble, then, you know, you expect people to take take their lumps, right? So you expect equity to take their lumps. As it is, and when the government decides to shut things down because they want to protect a certain part of society's health, um, you know, there's a different moral imperative. Like... It, in actual fact, I think in the last 12 months, we've seen more forbearance from banks than I've ever seen in my whole lifetime. I've been around the market for a long time. You know, I went through the 90s. Uh, you know, I know how <laughs> banks can foreclose on things and behave in aggressive manner. Last year was not aggressive. It has not been aggressive to date. And who was that really initiated by? Was that off their own bat? Was that... Uh, the regulators, regulators got involved um, yeah. without a doubt, and I think they, you know, should be complimented for that. Who I, should be complimented, the government or the banks? I think the regulators. <laughs> um, I don't I, listen. The banks. Uh, listen, I, I still remember what my father used to say about the banks. He used to say, you know, banks, uh, someone that wants to lend you an umbrella when it's not raining. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But, so, um, they're, 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 listen, they're, they'll be as aggressive as they can be. Uh, in Australia, we've got an oligopoly of banks. Uh, you know, that means they can behave in uh, ways that you know, 
maybe they wouldn't be able to behave enough. You mentioned speculation before. Do you think that we are, do you think investors are playing a speculative game, maybe some, some parts of the market? Yeah, it's always, uh, listen, I, if I were to go back in history, uh, everyone before the Second World War, equity was always seen as a speculative asset. Mm. It was always seen as a speculative asset. Right? People would only invest in bonds and credit. Um, uh, now I see a lot of speculative sort of behaviour in companies that are not making money. There's a lot of unicorns around. Um, mm. <laughs> unicorns aren't supposed to exist, right? Um, so, yeah, I think there is some speculative around, but speculation around. Um, but some of it will also end up being proper investment. It's sort of like 2000, you know, there were some companies that were not worth the speculation and other companies that ended up being fantastic investments. What do you think some of those um, industries or areas of the market might be? So you talk about the 90s or 2000s with, you know, the internet. Like what do you see potentially coming out of this? Uh, the companies that I think aren't going to do so well. Um, listen, we've, we've, where we're seeing changes, like, you know, it may well be banking ends up being a, uh, an industry that comes under pressure, like mm. the fintech invasion into that area could be quite large. Mm. I think the banker's best friend is the regulator um, and the government. Um, I think there's other industries as well, like obviously, um, there's certain property markets that look a bit frothy and problematic. Um, retail, I think the death of retail is a bit premature, but obviously retail property is under a bit of pressure. Uh, office property, uh, people are saying is under pressure. I think office comes back. I think people need the culture of an office. Mm. I think it's a challenge the way we manage our families. I think that's the issue. It's, it's creating, you know, raising those social issues, having two parents working. It's mm. a social issue we've got to look at. Like a... Know, Bentham's looking to sponsor um, an investigation into tax deductible um, childcare. I think that's something that should happen. It's stupid that it hasn't been put in place already. I, I think both political parties have failed. Mm. So one of the things that I want to talk a little bit about, if that's okay with you, you recently released a, a paper which I've read back to front. Um, it, Inflation scenarios. You've read it back the front? Or yeah, read it front, front to back. back. <laughs> you actually listened to what I'm saying. That was a test. Inflation scenarios and the impact on traditional Australian balanced portfolios. And so the first thing that you or Bentham open up with is three ways that this could play out in the next decade over the 20s. Yep. And the thing that I'm really curious about, there's not that many parallels that are being drawn between what we've gone through and what we're going through now and what we did see uh, during the early 1900s leading up to the, the 1920s. And if people look in the history books, what we do see is a probably one of the longest time frames uh, in, or that we have at, uh, data for, rising interest rates from 1900 right up to 1921, 21 years of rising rates. Yep. Uh, and, you know, we, we crunched the numbers recently and put out a note which showed the corresponding stock market performance uh, okay. as well. I mean, the stock market for that 20-year for that period, interestingly, um, moved sideways. Yep. Periods of big ups, periods of big downs. Yep. Um, but then what happened, as we all know, from during the roaring 20s, I'm, I'm curious before we get into sort of how you see things playing out over the course of the next five or ten years, do you see strong parallels between the 1920s and the, and the roaring 20s and potentially the roaring 20s of, of, the, of, um, of the 2000s? <laughs> yeah, it's funny, actually. Because well, pent-up demand, it, lockdown, it's yeah, like... I agree. I, listen, I, you know, you came out of the Spanish flu period. Um, you had a lot of debt post the First World That's War. That's right. But, yeah, there, there's similarities. There's no doubt. But, but it's also different, right? And, and the other big thing of the roaring 20s was technology changing. Yeah, that's right. There was a lot. Radio was a big thing. Yeah. You know, uh, to be honest, uh, <laughs> pneumatic tyres were a big thing. Um, yeah, listen, there, there are, but there are also very different times as well. We've got a much more evolved economic system as well. You know, we have a, a, a welfare system that we never had sure. in that time, which provides a lot more support. Um, and we've weathered things, I think, pretty well. And, you know, I think that the way... 
governments have responded for this crisis has been quite good. Um, now, maybe they've put too much good into the economy and we'll see that come through this year. Let's see. So can you give us a rundown, Richard, of what, in your mind, you think are potential outcomes from where we sit today? Sure. Well, there's, there's three sort of potential outcomes we see. It's like you do have the... Uh, um, uh, the outcome a lot of people have been going, say, talking about is a very low inflationary environment. Um, we have subpar growth. You have a lot of companies that have been supported by government, mm-hmm. and we, we call that the zombie, uh, the zombie apocalypse, uh, where you've got a lot of companies that are they're not hugely profitable, but they're not really profitable. Sure. They're sort of limping along, uh, and so that's the <laughs> it's the zombie apocalypse, the Walking Dead. Um, and low growth. Um, now, that's one scenario, and to be honest, if you were talking to me in November last year, that was the dominant philosophy. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, another one is, uh, you know, you could have a higher return of inflation, and, and which is sort of, sort of the more roaring 20s idea. Uh, and that's basically you see pent-up demand released, uh, when the economy gets turned back on. Mm. Um, again, we haven't had a normal recession because half the economy has been running at full tilt. The other half has just been closed. It's very unusual. Yeah. And I think we could see a really high-kicking recovery. You'll see inflation numbers pop up. And how do, how people deal with that uh, large growth number and large inflation number will be interesting, especially with very low interest rates like that. It makes sense that there's a response to that. Now, it doesn't have to be a large response, but it should be a response. But the starting point for returns on most assets have those yields as a starting point. We have to be mindful of that. Can you just explain that? So the the starting point of a the yield currently is the starting point for one's returns going forward? Yeah, right. If you look at all assets, you look at the potential uh, yield on assets right now, it's obviously a function of where long-term rates are. So if you look at a yield on an asset, and you, you would have seen your investors looking for yield all around the place, sure. right? Um, if you had normal interest rates, high-yield bonds would be yielding 9 to 10%. Currently, they're uh, yielding 5%. Sure. And the credit margin's still there. It's just the yield's not there because the interest rate's not there. Sure. So the starting point basically means all assets are priced off that same yield curve, but the yield curve's very low. And it just... So in my mind, it says that that yield curve has to rise over time. Um, and it's sort of, uh, you know, it's, uh, again, my father's got turning phrases all around the place. It's like if you ask an Irishman for direction, um, well, I wouldn't start from here. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. so that's sort of where we are on returns. I wouldn't start from here. So the potential return from these assets relative to potential inflation, I think, is, is reasonably low. But does a high tide not float all boats as it relates to uh, whether it's government bonds or, or credit? Because everyone talks about savers being penalised for low rates with low rates. And now we've, we're getting... Well, it depends if they've invested or not. If they've invested, they're not being penalised. But sure. if they're holding cash, yeah, they, you know, they're going backwards by you know, 2% a year. Um, that's an issue, right? And so, so again, I, I don't think uh, rates have found, uh, sorry, go back to an equilibrium level that matches the potential environment. But if I was yes. a central banker with high unemployment, I would be saying, oh, I'm going to keep rates low for a long time. Do we have high unemployment? <sighs> you know what? We don't now because... JobKeeper and alike, and, and, and this is a global phenomenon, has been quite supportive. Like governments have been quite supportive. That's coming off at the end of March. I do think uh, you'll see, you've seen a lot of temporary unemployment, and that temporary unemployment is an interesting thing. So while we've got a yes, high unemployment yes. rate, a lot of people believe that they're only temporarily unemployed, and that changes their behaviour. I do believe that the unemployment rate will fall a lot quicker than people think this year. The unemployment rate will fall. Correct. Yeah. I think it will fall a lot quicker. I think a lot of employment when the service economy comes back will be a huge upkeep. And I've actually heard people talking about uh, someone, uh, one of the local restaurants in Melbourne that I visited yesterday. It was very nice. Thank you very much. 
Um, and they were talking about it's hard to get staff right now, mm. which is unusual. And it's hard to get staff. Why? Is everyone just sitting on job keepers? Well, I think there's job keepers one element, but I, I'm, sh- I'm sure that stopping will actually help things. But I think it's a global phenomenon. This, uh, you know, you've got, like Australia has not been hard hit in this. Like if you go, if you, sorry, and I, I haven't been, but I've talked to a lot of people in New York and London. They're not back in the office yet. Yeah. Like in Sydney, we're back in the office. Yeah. Uh, Melbourne's no different. Yeah, you know, June, I think a lot of people will be back in the office, June, July. Uh, you know, that's going to be like that June to September quarter, I think is going to be interesting. It's going to be really interesting. So we talk about higher interest rates having adversely impacting bonds. Is the positive to take out of that not that interest rates are rising, which in turn means the yield on your investment is higher? So like, what are we complaining about? Yeah, well, it's obviously uh, <laughs> there's a change in valuation that comes through the change in net present value due to an increase in interest rates. Longer term, do I think it's better that we have slightly higher interest rates? Most definitely. Do you think I everyone th- thinks that? No, I don't. I think everyone is not looking forward to the transition to higher interest rates. At, at slightly higher interest rates, I think uh, financial markets will become more stable. There'll be a lot of positive things in it. But you have to get there. So how do we get there? And then that transition, like you know, um, someone that's borrowed floating rate at um, at two percent, um, are they going to be as happy when it goes to three percent? Right? They've maybe borrowed a bit too much. Mm. So we've got to be careful of how leverage is in the system mm. uh, and how that's going to impact things. And that's a debt problem that maybe um, down the track. And then, uh, sorry, the third scenario we talked about was a deflationary environment. Which how is likely like, is that? Surely deflation now where we are. No, I think it's highly unlikely right now, but you can never price that fully out. And that's uh, that's sort of – even Japan hasn't had long periods of deflation. And Japan is uh, hurled out as the poster child of sure. uh, deflation and an ageing population and all those things. But Japan's a very unique economy. It's not Australia. It's not the US. Australia actually has been a great beneficiary of globalisation and immigration. Um, you know, I'd mm. like to see that sort of return for Australia because I think it's good generally for Australia. But again, I think we also value lifestyle in Australia. So that's how how do we deal with that? Mm. One mm. of the one of the references you make here is globally manufacturing prices have been set by the lowest cost producers, particularly China, while service pr- prices have also been subject to global competition, even in professional services. So this is why demographic forces would be important in facilitating a sustained increase in, in labour costs. Can you just explain that? Oh, gosh. Uh, so let's pick it apart. There's a lot in that one, uh, one comment. Like one of the things that we've had globally, a big driver of uh, lower inflation has been uh, – like two two things. You've had uh, China joining yep. the world economy yep. and the Eastern Bloc joining the world economy. That's allowed a huge labour pool and quite a skilled labour pool to be accessed globally. Yep. Uh, and it's the most favoured nation sort of element towards the World Trade Organisation allowing China to have that benefit. China's no longer a developing nation. I think it's a developed nation. So I think some of those benefits that they've had maybe disappear. Um, and then how that supply chain's been worked. Like you're not going to see the same supply chain that you saw pre, prior to this. There's been a lot of interruptions in supply chains. Sure. Um, and in actual fact, we're seeing, you know, you can see it in uh, a lot of different markets where you're having trouble. Like Tesla, you know, even though Tesla's price share price has been going ballistic, they had to stop production in their cars because they didn't have enough chips. You know, that's a supply interruption. Sure. So there's going to be different supply chains created. And one of the things that we saw with this uh, crisis, this pandemic, is we saw uh, dependencies on uh, external supply chains yep. are not good enough. That's now, right. You basically, you get an interruption and then, you, you know, do you have supply? Um, it's, I think there is a change in supply chain. Services, though, tend to be more domestically based, but you have had an internationalisation of them as well. One of the things that I, I think you know, some people may underestimate is 
um, as we become more used to doing uh, digital commerce, um, maybe you can do more services internationally. I, 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 I'm not sure if that's the case. But is that, if, is that inflationary or deflationary? Well, the, the internationalisation has been deflationary. Yeah. I think it's in reverse right now. Why? Why is it in reverse? Uh, basically, it's supply chain interruptions. Uh, there's a lot of politics around it as well. Like if you're actually outsourcing a lot of the uh, middle management jobs overseas and actual professional jobs. I, I did some soundproofing in our office. Um, the uh, acoustic engineers were based in Portugal. It says something. And that's a good example I mean, I know when I've had things done, whether it's design work or some sort of consulting work, the likes of and mark and, and platforms such as Freelancer or, or Upwork or those types of um, platforms have allowed people like me and a whole bunch of other people, I'm sure, have access to uh, equally as clever, equally as professional uh, people that can deliver the same thing maybe even a better job, for a fraction of the cost. So t- I take your point on, on, on the labour and the cost of labour and I take your point on, on logistics. Um, do, do you think that there's an element of deglobalization going on post-pandemic whereby we start to do things less globally and more in our own backyard, so to speak? Yeah, I, I think there's an element of that. I'd- I, listen, generally speaking, I, I still believe in global trade um, and that has been a big driver of lower inflation. But you've also got to remember that China's no longer a low-cost producer. No. It's actually changing. So I think that the big gains, the structural gains in uh, inflation have sort of disappeared. And then again, uh, it depends on each country's demographic. So with different demographics, you get different results. So, I, I, listen, I think we've underbuilt, we've underdone a lot of things. Um, and after this period of hibernation, I think there's going to be a lot more activity. And so with all of this that's going on, I think the last the last 12 months have been really interesting for, for a lot of people. Uh, we've got far more market participants now in probably more so uh, equity markets. We've got asset classes that have emerged over the course of the last six or 12 months that didn't exist uh, or maybe weren't as prevalent as as they are today. What's an example of that? Um, digital tokens, for example, artwork. Um, there's more cryptocurrencies, which I'm you know I'm not a I'm not a huge buyer of. I mean, I think there's probably um, you know Bitcoin, obviously one of the major ones, which has just been on absolute tear again over yeah. the last over the last few weeks. Um, something that volatile. Uh, I don't think is something that can be used as sort of a... a, so a preser- if you're looking for a preserver value, which is a lot of investing is preserving value and preserving the real value of money, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. It is hard. And, and I know one of the comments that were made, I mean, one of the new trends underway, which is, is almost that unexpected impact of the global financial system with the development of digital currencies by central banks following on from Bitcoin and other private currencies. Like, what, what's your take on, on that? So we, and I've had this conversation with a number of people where we talk about government debt, we talk about um, the instability and the uh, potential weak stru- structural framework that we have in our economy. Yeah, digital money is really weird, right? Why? It's really weird because um, if you allow governments to have digital money, then you can have negative rates. Uh, And so currently there's a lower bound of negative interest rates. I don't discuss it, but it's the storage cost of cash, right? So what does that mean? Well, basically, if if the government is uh, going to set interest rates at a negative level, you can store cash. If you can find a way to store cash securely, for half a percent, or you're, and the interest rate is negative 1%, you're making half a percent a year. So how, how does someone do that? How does someone securely store millions of dollars? Because the banks won't let you do it. Well, yeah, and that's actually quite interesting, right? Well, you could have bought the old RBA building that had uh, big sure. safes down below it, and I, I thought that was a bit of a steal when it was sold, although uh, I think there's a few stings in the tail of that one. Uh 
It's it's difficult, but that was the lower bound, right? Now, if you have a purely digital currency, then you can adjust the the rate to whatever you want it to be, and that can be expansionary or not. Like one thing would be to argue that uh, low interest rates uh, have had a perverse effect on saving, right? They've actually caused people to save more, not less. And so maybe that, that whole idea hasn't actually hasn't actually been well thought through. Um, so if you think about it, like you, because the potential return is lower, you've got to save more, and hence sure. and it's and it's been an aid for you know wealthier people rather than less wealthy people, and all it's done is increase the price of you know the cost of living for the average person. And I don't really understand this that enough. Uh, and you may, you may or may not either. But h- how does a government then control, or central bank or authorities, let's call it, control digital currency? Yeah, well... Because isn't one, that the whole point of the yeah, digital currency? Well, sorry, no. The, the, China's actually experimenting with a digital currency that they control. Okay. <laughs> central government? Why, why not? I, I do actually have an issue with uh, cryptocurrencies because I do think they're being used as a cash... Uh, a way of moving uh, black money yeah. around, yep. you know, criminal money. And, and that's what I have a problem with. And that's probably one of the reasons that it exists as well, right? So it allows people to move money uh, quickly, anonymously, um, you know, in a way that that's really what you don't want if you, you sure. know, do any money money laundering. I'm, I'm surprised it's not a bigger centre of focus for a lot of central banks, to be honest. Are you saying that there's no money laundering currently with our cash system? <laughs> Come on. Uh, no, I'm saying that there should be no money laundering with our cash system. We have, uh, we, you remember the CBA incident with the uh, the ATMs that had a, uh, yeah. a software glitch, which meant they could receive a lot of thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars just through an ATM just being fed. Um, and then, of course, we have some more recent events with some gambling companies that have been accepting large um, uh, know, bags of cash. But let, let's put money laundering aside, right? Like, forget what type of system we have. So I don't think it's just there. Like, I think, you know, you see money laundering through the tax system that where you see, uh, you know, a lot of developments being run by uh, <laughs> People laundering drug money, right? So you just do a lot of, you know, do renovations on houses. It becomes a tax-free gain. Um, and if you don't, if you pay your, you know, your sparky in cash, that's why. Sounds like you know a bit about this, Richard. No, I think about it. I don't. It's like a running cash in my world. Like what what I've always learned, and from uh, a father in small business, is never get in trouble with the tax office. Because they've got very long memories, <laughs> yeah. So just just pay your tax and be happy. But let's it. let's assume there will there will and there will always be some form of money laundering, whether it's whether it's cash system or it's digital a, currency. It's a friction okay. in a, in an economy. Put that aside. Yep. Let's talk about digital currency as a uh, as an alternative asset, as a store of value. How do authorities? So you talk about China experimenting with that. How is that any different to? China printing their own money, like physical or digital. I, I, I'd struggled. I, I don't. I don't understand the difference. Yeah, I, I suppose the thing with uh, a digital currency is you can change. You know, if you have printed money, um, it, it's hard to take. It's hard to take. Uh, you know, ten dollars out of that hundred dollars. Um, you know, right. Can, and what does that mean? Well, that means you've got the printed. You've got the physical money in your hand, right? If it's digital, like they can actually decrease the cost, the, the value of that money by decreasing the holding cost of holding it and doing because it. Because you don't physically have to hold you it don't anyway. physically hold it. No. Right. But isn't the whole point to try and have some sort of digital currency that is that authorities and central banks don't control? Like isn't isn't No, no, that's the that's that was the original reason of Bitcoin and the sure. like. But that was actually to avoid the system. Not to run the system. Yeah. There's two different things here. Like, so you have one that's uh, anti the system and one that's for the system. Uh, listen, I, it's not one of those things. I'm feel. I, I feel there's a lot of thought that still needs to go into this. I think payment systems are going to be very interesting going forward. I think payment systems yeah, I agree. Are, are very interesting. Um, there's no reason why we can't have real payment systems. I, know I have friends working in that area. I 
and, you know, and fintech we're looking at quite seriously. But we're a credit manager. We're looking at how um, businesses can be sustainable. Um, again, we like to see equity investments because it becomes the cushion for our shop. Um, but, yeah, I, there's a lot of change happening. And, uh, you know, there is an evolution of different things happening. I, I think maybe uh, sometimes things don't go as quick as you think. Um, you know, who, who do you bet on in this current environment? Like, from our point of view, like, we, we would just want to get paid our coupons. Uh, to be honest, with interest rates going up, if we've got floating rate coupons, that means as interest rates go up, we get paid more. I like that. Uh, if interest rates go mm. down, we'll have liable floors. Um, you know, that's the way we look at this market. Um, we're not, to be honest, we're not as dependent on interest rates as most other assets. So. Yeah. You mentioned sort of after World War II, we had more market participants in the stock market, for example, yeah. where prior to that, there wasn't much participation. And in fact, if you go back to pre-depression and, and through yep. the Spanish flu in the roaring 20s, market participation was even lower than that. And the, the stock market was basically run, run like a casino, right? It was, it was yeah. really just pure speculation and, and pure gambling. And I kind of feel like... Joseph with, Kennedy was one of the guys that uh, you know they put the wolf in charge of the uh, hen house yep. thing with the SEC, right? Yeah. And, and so you sort of think about what we've gone through there and that... that um, evolution of of markets and and secondary markets and capital markets so pre-depression then you've got post-world war ii where you've got far more market participation yep like i'm just wondering these um these nfts these digital currencies a whole bunch of other assets that appear to be speculative now like i'm genuinely curious whether those assets and those asset classes start to become far more mainstream listen they could rob and it's possible, right? Um, again, it's how much you have in your portfolio that does that. And again, like you should always have a certain amount of your portfolio that's in speculative assets that, you know, that's the high kicking stuff. Um, is that something you're going to risk your whole capital on? I don't think that's prudent. Um, again, uh, you can be entrepreneurial in maybe your business where you have more control. But sure. On your investments, I think it's about preserving capital. Um, and getting a return. Um, sometimes you want to have aggressive returns. Sometimes you don't want to have aggressive returns. So you've got to be careful what you what you want to do. You can definitely take a lot more risk. It's just sometimes uh, you can take a lot more risk without getting a return, and that's where you really don't want to be involved. But, yeah, yeah, and, and you're, you're right. I think it's just managing how much of certain things you start allocating to. I think that's a. I think it's a really important um, reminder. We've been talking for. A, a long time now, this concept of uh, lower for longer, uh, yep. one, as it relates to rates, but also two, everyone's been talking about risky assets uh, having brought forward future returns. Yep. I, I, I still feel like that seems to be, uh, and notwithstanding rates starting to go higher now, that seems to be the tune that everyone's playing yet again. But we've been talking about the same thing for the last 10 or 12 years, maybe getting close to, well, since the GFC, right? Yeah. So close, maybe close to 15 years. Now. Yeah, I, I, I think the most important thing to understand about this current cycle, or I think one of the more important things, is this is not the GFC. Okay? This is not, this is a really quick, we're going to get a quick bounce here. This is not a. You strong, believe that? You, you believe? I strongly believe it. Um, it's definitely not the GFC. Like, we just, and the, the level of stimulus is just huge. Now, the only thing that could change that is if uh, the virus starts to mutate and, and we live with this consistently for years and years and years, that sure. would be an issue. Um, but if we have, a va- have the vaccines and we go back to the, the economy goes back to normal, I think this will be a very, uh, a very high-kicking recovery and that's going to be different. And so we just have to... Ec- economically? And do you think that then translates financially as well? Yeah, I do. And then how much is fully priced and what's not fully priced? Like, mm. There's been a lot of debt issue and issued by companies um, to get to bridge over this period, okay, to get through the pandemic period. Uh, a lot of that debt needs to be paid back. It wasn't borrowed at particularly high rates. 
So it, it's possible that it gets repaid. Um, a lot of companies will come back. There are a lot of companies that aren't going to make it back. You know, and are they the zombie companies that you refer to? Like, are they are they the ones that aren't going to be able to pay the, these debts back? No, zombies pay debt. They just don't pay equity. Okay, so the equity is not good in that situation. I don't think we're going into the zombie environment, and I don't think we're going into the deflationary environment. I think we're small roaring twenties right now. Mm. Uh, it, but again, like it's a cute phrase because it's the 20s. Sure. It's, yeah. 20s, it's cute. Yeah. Right? Um, it, it will be different to that. Mm. Um, and we've got a much more evolved economy and, you know, maybe a, sure. an older population as well. Um, again, um, I, I think China's much more important as part of the economy um, globally. And... You know, it'll be curious to see how we develop out of this. You know, you see where iron ore prices are, you know, there's demand coming through. I think probably... But isn't that just cyclical? Yeah, it is. It is. But cyclical is, you know, it's another way of saying a business cycle, right? So, you know, we've, yeah, that's we, right. don't, we don't have enough of something. We need to... And if infrastructure continues, so if we get an infra, infrastructure spend continuing, that's going to be around for a little while. Um Again, I think oil is probably a little bit low right now. You know, it could go up quite considerably. You know, it could be in the eighties and nineties by the end of the year um, because activity is going to turn back yeah. on and see people travelling again. So it's it's you know, and, and if you ask anyone, you know, are you looking forward to travelling next? When you can get overseas, will you go overseas? Like I, I actually think it's pretty interesting. Do you think we could have a situation where economically we you talk about having a boom? boom economy, do you think we could ever be in a situation where then subsequently businesses are not doing well, so our investments and our portfolios and stock markets are not doing well, notwithstanding if we are genuinely of the belief that our economy is going to boom from here? Yeah, it's curious, isn't it, Rob? Right? If we have growth a uh, percent higher and interest rates a percent higher, it's actually not much of a change, right? It, it's, it all stays the same, right? If we have growth 2% higher, and interest rates, you know, one and a half percent higher. We're doing better, relatively. So yeah, I, I, it's possible that you could get both. I, I do think we're going to have a very strong growth number this year. The print's going to be large. Now, how transitionary it is? Well, let's see. Let's see. I, I, you know, growth. Um, you've got a bit of bit of this paying back debt, and we've got to we've got to see normalisation of rates. But normalisation of rates will mean. Um, uh, is it going to be 5%? I don't think it's going to be 5%. I think maybe 3 But it might be in the years ahead. And everyone yeah. sort of but, starts to talk that, about... But that's okay, right? If we, if the growth numbers yep. are coming through, we'll we'll deal with that, right? And we'll deal with that. But some assets will have to be repriced. Like, you know, if you've got a really long... So an example is, say, a 30-year asset, an infrastructure asset, um, you know, it's being priced on a discount rate. You know, maybe it's got a... Uh, a two, two and a half handle plus a risk premium of two, that's four and a half. You know, if that risk rate goes up by 2%, that's 20 year duration. So that's a 40% loss. Okay. It's a long duration asset. You know, you've got to be Sorry. aware of this stuff. This, it's just, it's just the maths of uh, investing. Uh, again, um, I think we tend to extrapolate the current situation too much sometimes and, you know, we're going to go through a changing environment. Now, it's going to be hard for central banks to start raising interest rates. Yeah. Um, but when they start raising interest rates, it'll be because growth is, will be strong. Yeah, I, to I totally and, agree. And, and uh, you know what? You'll probably be saying it's not a bad idea and you know what? Maybe I've had some good returns and I want to put some money in cash now and cash will be at a higher rate. Um, so we'll survive it, but the transitionary time is always is always, always problematic. I, 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 you made a comment before about extrapolating what's got, what, what's happened into the future, and if you look back all the way back, even even the late eighteen hundreds, you look at data. These things take a while to unfold. It's not like they happen in a matter of three or four or six months. These things take years. In which case the the economy and the market starts to adapt, the investors start to have a new normal and understand what the base case scenario yeah. is. And I just feel like everyone's sort of getting too hyped up about something that is probably going to take a lot longer than what most of us think. Am I on the wrong page there? I don't, I, don't think, I don't think the market's sold off that much, to be honest. 
I, no, I, no, I, I don't think the market has. But if you read the papers, if you hear the headlines, like the papers and the headlines, like you know, uh, papers want to sell papers. They don't have as many journalists. They're, they uh, so do they have the uh, the attention span of a goldfish? Um, yes, they do. Uh, you know, they, 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 like I don't think reading the newspapers is a way to invest. You've got to have some more discipline around it. Um, you know, everyone's going to get upset. Like, I, I, I think it's surprise. I, I think I'd be more surprised if people weren't talking about interest rates going up from where they are now. Like, it is surreal where we are. Like, you know, if, if a lot of your older investors would have, you know, bought their first house with a ten percent interest rate, right? You know, and glory to them. You know, they really uh, had had courage to do that. But that's when inflation was high, mm. um, so they could do it. Um, you know, I just th- I just think we're not at an equilibrium for interest rates right now. Um, where is that equilibrium? Where does it end? That's an interesting point. Like, I think it's higher than we are now. Um, is that going to be hard for people to adapt to and transition to? Yeah, maybe it is. Depends how much debt they've got on their balance sheet. Um, I think we've got other issues to deal with. We've got intergenerational wealth issues to yeah. deal with. Yeah, uh, you that's a that whole topic on its own. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. Like, it's just huge. And, and, and again, like, you've got wealthy older people, very poor younger people, and it's hard to buy a house. Like, you know, maybe interest rates going up is not such a bad thing for housing prices because it brings housing prices down. Um, you know, having said that... Um, We've been talking about lower housing prices for how many years now? No, low ha- housing prices is a supply and demand thing. Like, it's yeah. never going to change yeah. until the supply and demand. But you know what? The funny thing is in Melbourne, as you really see it in Melbourne, right, the... Um, uh, external demand for uh, housing in apartments and the like has had a big impact yeah. here and that's where the weakness is. It's not yeah. in the housing market, your Torrens title house, you know, I see, I see people bidding over for that every day. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting environment. But again, I, I, I think uh, uh, you wouldn't be dead for quids. It's going to be very interesting in the next few years. Uh, there's going to be ways of making money that are different they were before, and in some ways, you know, they'll be uh, they'll be better. In some ways, they'll be worse. There'll be there'll be losses made. There'll be profits made, and we'll adapt. Sounds like you're just telling a, a, uh, a description and describing what history's been like over the last hundred years. So you, you talk about there's going to be money made. I just want to finish off with one final question. With what we know, what we've spoken about now, where is the money money going to be made for investors going forward from here? Yeah, in the transitionary period where the most likelihood you'll make money, floating rate credit, you'll be paid your risk premium. As interest rates go up, you won't lose money. Um, and it'll be, you know, where you don't lose money is just as important as where you make money. So if you can make money and not lose on that interest rate change, that's important. Um, you've already seen property, this property trust get hurt a little bit because of interest rate changes, but it's not just interest rate changes. It's also... Vacancy rates on offices, uh, vacancy rates on retail and the like. Um, definitely credit will give you a good return in that environment. It's it, it, Unfortunately, bonds won't be giving you that defensive return that you used to get, which used to allow you to take more risk, to be mm. honest. You think about it, that's, you know, the paper that we were talking about was all about why did that work? Why did that work so well? Mm. Like, you know, if you look at it, uh, you know, the 40, 60 portfolio split of bonds and equities has been the biggest free kick, like the structural change down in interest rates has been enormously beneficial for people. It's allowed them to stay fully invested in equities and do well. And one of the big issues that you have right now is that more conservative portfolios may not look as conservative as they used to look. Mm. It's the potential for a negative returns higher because of the lower rates. Yeah, and it's, it's it's one of those things like you'll never know until after the fact, right? You never do. So <laughs> it's, it's a, you never do, and that's and that's why you have to you have to start working on. Look, I'm very happy that we're active investors and we move our portfolio accordingly. We think it's, it's worked well for us in the last twelve months. Uh, longer term, it's worked well for us. Um, I think you know we're in a good part of the market. You know, like providing income for older, older people and, and large superannuation funds. Like, you know, the industry funds have been very supportive of us. They're very, you know, we think they're, they're uh, not only are they intelligent, they're also very good-looking people. <laughs> I, I think with um, 
uh, with all the things that are going on now, you hit the nail on the head before. It's a matter of understanding what elements of risk are within uh, your portfolio. And even within each of your asset classes, I think what the last few years have taught people is that even within asset classes, there are a variety of different uh, risk parameters that you can you can uh, look at and take. And I think that's going to be uh, as if not more important going forward, understanding all the components that make up a portfolio, how much is allocated where, and even looking back in history to understand We've, because we've been through this many times before. We've been going for, for, for over 150 years of data that we actually have. Sure, interest rates may not be at the precise rates that they are now, but we've had low rates. A 10-year US Treasury rate has been in the mid-ones. Yep. It has been there before. Yeah, of course it has. And, and, you, and there are ways of making money, and that's, I don't think we should be... Listen, putting a portfolio together, that's the, the, real, the real thing. Um, a lot of people will find they have too much exposure to one asset. Yeah. You know, a portfolio effect is really useful because it's less correlated returns that make sense and because they, you know, that creates a more efficient portfolio over time. Um, but let's see how we go. Let's see how we go. It's, uh, it's you know, it's going to be an interesting time. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the Chinese curse. Um Let's, uh, let's see how we go in this next period. And, uh, you know, I, I'm looking forward to the economy opening up. Uh, again, uh, in Sydney, we've been better better off than most people around the world. You know, I talked to a lot of people in New York and London. I've talked to people that have had whole families uh, that have caught COVID and survived it. Um, hasn't been pleasant. Um, and a lot of people that haven't been back to work for 12 months. Mm. You know, in offices in New York that just, you know, those office space has just been vacant for 12 months. Now, they're pretty keen to get back to work. Yeah. Well, there's never a dull moment in markets as much as we try and make it out to be that you know, <laughs> markets are something that whereby you have dull moments and you, all the stars are constantly aligning, which is not the case. Richard Quinn, I, I appreciate your time today. Thanks for joining me. Uh, Rob, it was a pleasure and uh, yeah, thank you for your time and um, all the best to your investors going forward and uh, again... Uh, you know, thinking about things, there's never, never a problem in doing that. Thanks, Richard. Cheers, now.